The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So just as kind of a synopsis of some ideas that we're going to get through, um, we're looking at manufacturing, which is a way to profit from innovation. It's a way to scale innovation. And we'll do something of a historical review here today. So we'll look at the last big competitiveness challenge the U.S. went through, a challenge from Germany and Japan. Uh, we'll take a particular look at Japan's manufacturing innovations in the 70s. Uh, we'll review a distributed model of production that the U.S. came up with in some ways in response. Uh, we'll look at manufacturing and innovation organizational shifts within both Korea and Japan. Uh, and then talk a bit about how the nature of the competition is changing uh, as well. So that's kind of a backdrop. And then next week will be a more pointed focus. So the first piece we'll go through, and I'll lay it out. And, um, Chris, do you have, you know, Rashid, you've got Hughes. Yeah. Right, OK. So this is Ken Hughes. Um, Ken Hughes was, um, you know, led the um, Joint Economic Committee. He's a staff director in the Congress. He was a senior official in the Department of Commerce. And he kind of wrote the history of the competition over production between the US and China, a period of time that he was very deeply engaged in policy making. Um, so let's get this backdrop kind of down, because I think it'll help us see a lot about what the U.S. is going through now in terms of manufacturing. So in the 1970s, the U.S. faced, you know, a mess. Um, intractable high inflation, um, declining productivity growth, a slow, therefore a slow growth rate, rising economic competition, rising national anger, frustration with government, sound familiar. Um, and the US model of kind of pretty unfettered markets of limited government support for industry was a very different innovation model, innovation system, than what Japan and Germany were pursuing. Um, and that in turn led to the beginnings of what could be called in the US a national competitiveness strategy. So, the essential elements of that history, uh, the initial response to Japan's development of quality manufacturing, which we'll get into in a minute, uh, there were different responses from each party. And these will be familiar to you as well. So each party was organized. Remember when we discussed classical economics, right? And the key factors in classical economics were capital supply and labor supply. Each of our parties is organized around our parties, right? So the capital supply response um, came from the Republican side and Congressman Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp of Buffalo and Bill Roth, who was chairman of the Finance Committee in the Senate from Delaware, they were, their argument was, let's adjust marginal tax rates that'll spur capital availability and investment and will recover. Uh, Democrats were organized around their traditional mantra of labor supply, broadly defined, right? Um, and they had moved towards what, what was then known as industrial policy, still known as industrial policy. So they were looking to rescuing failing industries um, and reorganizing them for turnarounds. And at a later time, through the Young Commission, another set of ideas begins to enter the discussion around, quote, sunrise industries. Uh, the Young Commission tried to cut between these two party perspectives and develop a different approach. So John Young was head of Hewlett Packard, uh, and President Reagan named him to head this commission. And their focus was on national competitiveness. And they concurred that things like fiscal and monetary policy are important, uh, but 
they were also interested in what the innovation side and the research side could do. So it was not simply a governmental role in basic research, but basic technology. And they developed a model that was in this public-private partnership that was industry-led, and the term partnership nation you know, emerged from some of their work. So this was, in effect, a third way out of the box. The two parties had their underlying theories, and Young walks in with a different kind of approach. So he's out of the Silicon Valley. He's used to working with DARPA and the Defense Department, so he's not afraid of government um, and its technology support role. And it's, um, it's kind of a, this whole effort was called the New Growth Compact, right? So it was an attempt to cut between the parties and develop a series of new programmatic elements. So some of the things that eventually emerged, not specifically from the recommendations necessarily, but emerged over time, were created as cooperative R&D agreements with industry uh, between governmental laboratories and industry. So in other words, we've got these snappy governmental labs Little emerges from them. Could we do cooperative agreements to get technologies out of the labs into the hands of industry? It's a new tool. The Bay Dole Act comes out of the same time period, which prior to the Bay Dole Act, the federal government owned the fruits of the research that it supported at universities. Now, the federal government is not a commercial entity, so nothing happened to it. So it was moved to shelves. Right, the IP was not really utilized. So the Bay and Dole came up with the idea of giving the universities that had sponsored the research activities, supported the research activities with federal funds, let's give them ownership. And they in turn typically share it with their researchers and give them a vested stake in developing the technologies that the research is leading to. So this plays a really critical role in starting to put universities on the playing field as innovation actors, right? It gives them a stake in the outcomes of their research. The Advanced Technology Program and the Manufacturing Extension Program come out of the Commerce Department in an attempt to introduce um, both new technologies and an attempt to, and the MEP program, to bring the advances Japan had been pushing on quality production into small US manufacturers. Um, there were education proposals. The attitude was essentially pro-trade. In other words, don't ignore the world. Let's be successful at trade and be innovative at trade. Um, that attitude gets adopted by the Clinton administration and leads to things like NAFTA and the China WTO. Uh, so that's kind of what who's coming out of the Young Commission in terms of new ideas. But let's go back to the challenge that they were facing. What was this? What was this new model around production that, China, that Japan was launching? And I would argue that was big enough so that it, in fact, amounted to a significant innovation wave. And it was the one wave that the U.S. missed in the second half of the 20th century. So Japan hit on innovating in manufacturing as a way towards its own competitiveness as a leading world economic power. And before the 1970s, the US had come up with a way of dealing with quality. It was called the quality price trade-off. So in our mass production system, and the US essentially came up with most of the elements of mass production starting around the 1840s and moving you know, for 100 years, uh, the US become this dominant mass production. We had really invented mass production at huge scale. And we were selling manufactured goods into a continent-sized economy, the first continent-sized economy that existed in the world. Um, and part of the mass production idea was never stop the production line. Always keep it moving. Always keep producing. And how do you deal with quality? Well, you do a statistical analysis of the products you were producing. You would decide that some percent, some fixed percentage were not meeting those quality standards. 
And so at the end of the system, after you would produce the goods, you would have an inspection group throw out whatever it was, 1.8%, 2.4%, whatever the statistical number told you, after the production system had been developed. Quality is really how good is the product, quality control is what's the unit of, are there units of equal quality, right, across all that you're producing. Japan came up with a completely different system and a much better system. Um, and it was called here the Toyota model, but it was pervasive in Japanese manufacturing. So the idea here was build quality into each product, not at the end of the system throw a bunch of stuff away, ensure that the entire system is working to ensure quality. And anyone, any worker, can stop the production line if they see a quality problem. So catch it at the beginning and build quality into your entire production process. Um, the idea came actually from an American named Edward Deming, and he was unable to persuade U.S. manufacturers to adopt this model. So you know, he takes it to Japan. And, and you know, we, we sense Japan's rich culture here around craftsmanship, right? It fits wonderfully with it, right? So this is, you know, Japanese samurai culture, of course, respects the samurai but accords almost equivalent respect to the sword maker, right? Who is almost equally as famous. So there's a huge focus on high quality and craftsmanship in Japanese culture. So what Deming is saying fits with the kind of culture of Japan. Um, there are other pieces that Japan comes up with just in time inventory, in other words, a major burden that manufacturers face is that they have to store up a lot of inventory to have enough goods available for the marketplace. But when you hit an economic downturn, then you're stuck with this massive inventory that you can't get rid of, right? And it becomes a huge cost burden on your system. Japan's idea was produce for what the market is actually absorbing. In other words, produce just in time to get it to market. So that calls for a whole new level of efficiency and communications, uh, really IT embedded in, in, in <coughs> earlier kind of ways throughout the whole production system. Uh, it was, you know, and it significantly reduced the exposure of significant manufacturers to economic downturns. Um, Japan integrated its... Um, its dealers and its suppliers into its system. So in the US, major manufacturers would keep their suppliers at arm's length and have them bid, and there was no particular relationship. They were just looking for the lowest price, right? Japan, the suppliers were actually integrated into that system. And in turn, the dealers who were just, you know, selling these goods were also integrated in, so that you had much closer touch with what customers actually needed and wanted as well as what the quality of the suppliers, uh, what they were producing was going to be. Japan had a culture of respecting the production moment. So they would move their engineers onto the factory floor as their first set of assignments. So if you look at, in contrast, the US didn't do that, right? So the engineering profession was one in the 19th century in the US that was trying to take hold with those other established professions, doctors, lawyers, ministers. So when you look at these early photographs of MIT and you look at photographs of like MIT labs, there's wonderful photographs of the steam lab. You can't imagine, you know, coal dust all over the place. These characters are all wearing these starched white shirts with, you know, those fancy weird bow ties they wore at the end of the 19th century, right? They were so <clears throat> and proper. They're trying to be like ministers or doctors, right? They're trying to elevate their profession and separate themselves in a way from the work floor, right? So the engineers want to be in a glassed up area up above the, up above the factory floor in the US, right? They don't want to be down with, you know, heaven forbid the workforce. So, it's, it's an attempt by an engineering culture to establish its identity. You can understand why it happened. But Japan hit on a much better model, right? 
integrate the engineers and the workforce and make them one, right? Much better. Right? So we had to learn to get our engineers into the mix in the manufacturing sector. Japan came up with this quality manufacturing model. We Sometimes we call it here lean manufacturing. Um, it led to an effort by the US to essentially copy what Japan had come up with. We had to take apart the Toyota model. A lot of that work is being done at MIT, right? So Dan Roos and several others in MIT are writing up the Toyota model um, and explaining it to the rest of the country. It was a really important stage. Standard industry approaches like Six Sigma uh, that came out of GE have essentially attempted to incorporate Japan's quality ideas and make them pervasive in U.S. production for both major manufacturers, OEMs, and suppliers. So that's a few other things. There's there's a something called the product cycle, um, and time is a competitive factor in this. So eliminating time delays, and then something actually the U.S. really contributed to was concurrent engineering design. So you engineers in the room, I'm sure, know what I'm talking about. But in other words, if we were if 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 you and I constituted Chrysler Motors, the way in which we would organize Chrysler Motors in the old days was we would have a bunch of engineers and they would do the design. And then they would finish the design, and then they would take it to the production people. And the production people will say, Well, that's all very well and good, but we can't make that. So we do it, right? and then it would be redone. And then they would take it to the people again, and then take it to the marketing people. And the marketing people would say, well, that's all very well and good, what you engineering people have done, and what your factory floor people have done, but we can't sell this thing. So completely redo it. In other words, it was a stage-by-stage -stage process with every stage having a veto. So the, the development process for design was painful and lengthy, and often adversarial. Concurrent design is to put all those teams together at the outset, contributing to the design. Dramatic time savings, dramatic efficiency savings. So these are all kinds of ideas that came out of this time period. Another idea that Japan had, and we weren't organized in this way, Japan had a whole different way of approaching what we could call the labor trade, the, the labor trade-off. So Japan had a system of essentially guaranteed lifetime employment. So if you're a worker in Japan, you were pretty well assured of, at this in this era. It's changed a bit now. In this era of a lifetime job, and in return for that assurance of a lifetime job, management would control the work rules. In other words, what's actually happening on the factory floor, right? How that work process, what the rule system is. is. That was the trade-off. The U.S. had a completely different trade-off. We treated labor not as a fixed cost, like Japan did. We treated it as a variable cost. And the trade that unions insisted on, this is an era of pretty heavy unionization and manufacturing in the U.S. at that time. Unions weren't able to affect who gets hired and fired in the employment side of the equation, but they would control the work rules, right? And they designed those to be as protective as possible of their workforces, right? Not necessarily the most efficient system. So Japan actually had a better model, right? Now we continue to treat our workforce as a variable cost. Right? So whenever there's an economic downturn, U.S. companies dump their workforces as a quick response. Right, That's fundamental management theory really in the U.S. Other countries don't necessarily do it this way. Now, Japan has had to get more flexible in its model as it's gone to more global competition. But it had a completely different way of organizing its workforce. Labor became much more co collaborative rather than adversarial and ready to leap on new efficiencies in the production process, rather than fight them every inch of the way. So again, this was a contributing factor to the kind of new model that Japan was creating. There's another element here of industrial policy. 
So Japan is recovering from World War II. It develops an innovation system that is very focused on production. Right? That's what it's got to stand up again. And that's where this quality model comes from, from these other pieces. Um, and Japan is very resource poor. So starting in the 1880s, Japan understood that it had to have an export orientation. It had to export to live because it had to get the resources in order to produce, right, and buy those back. So it needed an export surplus to be able to do that. Um, it, in, in, one of its core institutions was called MEDI, Ministry of Industri International Trade and Industry, now called MEDI. Um, and that, the nickname for this was Japan Inc., but a very integrated system of governmental leadership tied to major industries. And the major industries weren't organized as they were in the U.S. We had antitrust laws in the U.S. We did not really impose them in the post-war period and allowed Japan to keep its, quote, Koretsu system. So that's a system of major firms typically engaged in production activities, financing, global trading, and then networks of suppliers that are tied to those. So these are groups of related firms that are all mutually owned and tied to each other, right? They would violate US antitrust laws in all likelihood, but that's the way Japan organized its core industries. Now, not all Japanese firms are part of these Koretsu, right? So a company like Sony was actually outside of this but most of its industry was organized in this very centralized kind of way, and you can see how their dealings with a major governmental entity like BD could be readily tied to unify government decision-making and industry decision-making. Um, so when the U.S. was competing against Japan in this quite centralized, quite efficient model, the U.S. had a lot of trouble coping. And You've seen the, you know, when we talked about Jorgensen, you saw some of the, of the productivity and GDP curves. So historic U.S. productivity rate, generally around 3%, around 2%, and historic U.S. GDP growth is generally around 3%, right? Between 73 and 91, those plummet. So we fall to productivity rates at around 1% and GDP growth about 2%. It was a pretty grim time in the United States. Uh, we were up against a powerful industrial competitor, and Japan was able to take economic sectors that the U.S. thought it would always have, like consumer electronics, like a large part of the auto sector, because it had a better innovation model. Um, so that's, you know, in, in a, a very brief period of time, uh, that's kind of what happened in the 70s and 80s. The U.S. response, as I suggested earlier, was that we would attempt to copy Japan on quality. And we called it lean manufacturing. But we would attempt to replicate as much as we could of that Toyota model. And by and large, our industries have pretty well done that. Um, but we also kept a focus on our very strong innovation system. So we launch in the 1990s the IT innovation wave, uh, which Japan misses. Right? And if you get your economy to a leadership right to the edge of the technological frontier, and you organize your economy around leading innovation ways, which Japan had just organized its economy around doing, around a new production system. And then you miss a wave, it can be pretty unpleasant, right? So it was unpleasant in the US when we missed a wave in the 70s and 80s. But then things got tough for Japan. Now that's not the only factor that's going on. There's macro economic factors, there's demographic factors, there's a series of things that are occurring simultaneously in Japan. But one part of the story is around missing this innovation. So that was the kind of response that the US came up with. Uh, it used its innovation system to develop 
effectively radical innovations in the IT space and create whole new industries. So we pursue radical innovation um, in a way, not consciously, but in a way that was effectively our response. Um, why don't we stop there and um, go through the sheets and discussion of Kent Hughes. Yeah. Um, so in Kent Hughes, I think he really uh, talks about sort of this 80s creed in Japan and then really isolates this sort of U.S. response. Um, so how is the U.S. going to respond to uh, kind of larger problems with our manufacturing system? Um, and really competing on that global scale now that uh, Japan sort of captured a lot of things going on with quality manufacturing and that sort of innovation wave. Um, I think one of the really important things uh, that he talks about is sort of uh, this bureaucratic climate. So there's a lot going on um, sort of with trade on the international scale, but uh, bringing it back home to the U.S., like you have to get a lot of people on board um, in order for you to sort of move forward in this cohesive way unless you're like riding an innovation wave. And so we're set up um, in a radically different way than Japan, and we have to kind of figure out what to do. And so um, talking about Ronald Reagan's response, uh, I think it was pretty cool and important that he, uh, Ronald Reagan sort of exercises um, his discretion with this uh, Commission on Industrial Competitiveness with John Young. Um, so I was just wondering if any of you guys had any feelings on uh, sort of the presidential power to um, not only kind of highlight issues, but sort of take the lead and take action um, separate from all the bureaucratic dealings. Oh, yeah, so Steph, I saw you reading it. Oh, I wanted to point attention to Matthew. <laughs> uh, I mean, I thought when I was reading it that they were, he was actually quite slow to act on it, and it was really Congress that kind of pushed uh, the efforts. Um, and later on, his tenure, he decided to that this was something that was important. It seemed more like a political thing at first. Yeah, or making motions without actually making actions, you know, it's just to sort of look like Reagan is taking action on this thing. And yeah, I, I agree. I thought he ended up dragging his feet and other people had to sort of push for anything to be enacted with the Young Commission. So I think um, one of the big pieces in this Young Commission is how they decide to like choose members and they pick uh, kind of large manufacturers in industry and they start with John Young. Um, but I thought it was interesting how like he didn't get uh, to sort of pick the, like hand pick the members that he'd like to be on his own commission. Um, I thought like that might be a little bit short-sighted considering he's gonna have to like work with all these people. Um, and it might be a way of sort of to drag your feet. Um, but I thought uh, the sort of what came out of the commission, which is this new report, uh, which highlights like a lot of these sort of transformative things um, sort of would have never happened if uh, he didn't sort of grab from all these places in industry and manufacturers. Um, but is there any sort of merit to sort of um, bringing these people in, having them work on this commission, and then publish this report, even though we don't sort of act on it, but you see like all of these things that he highlighted in sort of like the New Growth Compact, uh, maybe like 10 years down the line, like might really be important. And sort of this lays the groundwork for, you know, five or 10 years in the future when you're ready to sort of act on these things. Um, so I guess my question would be, is there merit to sort of, even if it's, uh, kind of haphazard attempt at addressing the issues, um, is it a still important metric? Maybe not now, but like five or 10 years down the line. Yeah, I think so. And with the Young Commission, I think that <clears throat> out of that commission, Young decided to form, what's the name? I'm blanking on it, but the, it still exists today. Um, I looked it up. The Council Just, on Competitiveness. Yes, exactly. So yes, there are lasting, lasting, knowledge and wisdom from a commission like this. So yeah, definitely it's better than it's better than nothing. It's better than sticking your head in the ground. I think some of the stuff they put forward is definitely extremely useful. It's there. It's published. <laughs> it's accessible. Yeah. I think it's one of those uh better late than never things, right? Because it only seems to happen that 
I don't know if this is a trend with the U.S. or like countries in general, but it only seems that they put in all this effort for one specific issue when something's going wrong, right? Why not prevent things from going wrong in the first place? Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. The, the government seems to be really hesitant to change their ways uh, <laughs> surrounding their views on specific policies around innovation. So, like I said, better late than never, but... I, in my opinion, it'd be better, you know, why not, why didn't they do this decades before? I think the question I asked and with relation to this reading is, uh, Hughes largely characterizes domestic policymaking as reactionary, and I agree. Mm -hmm. What hope exists for utilizing, A, the courts under the living constitutionalist framework to really address these questions and or meaningfully integrating the kinds of knowledge and uh, consensus that is created in these commissions. And I don't know that there's yet a model for effective consensus building outside of these commissions and translating that to policy action with collaboration in the legislative branch or the judicial branch. And that's, I think, where your point sort of comes into action, that there is an opportunity for proactive policymaking, but it has to be integrated with discussions around the branches. It can't just be isolated in one branch because then, as Hughes pointed out, there's going to be competition amongst them on what the right thing is to do. Uh, yeah, so that brings maybe my follow-up question. Um, I might be able to help us out here. So I think the president, um, in this way, like really was able to just kind of use his power to this exercise and kind of call for this study and commission. Is there a way um, for sort of legislators to kind of do the same thing. Um, let's say I'm the you know, uh, Committee on uh, Energy. Can I uh, call for a study um, or the you know, committee or the section of Congress that deals with manufacturing? Um, can they sort of call for a study in the same way? And then maybe work with the executive branch to kind of do the same thing. I mean, just a comment, you know, from my background experience, I've worked in the Senate for about 15 years. Yes, the, you know, the committees of Congress can function on an ongoing basis to try and identify Kevin exactly the problem you are raising, which is be a little foresighted. Some committees are obviously much better at this than others historically. Um, and, but there's, there's no guarantees, and frankly, government tends to respond to crisis. Uh, and if there's not a crisis, it's hard to get it mobilized, organizing, and moving to be foresighted. That's not necessarily all bad, right? There's advantages of, you know, having limits on uh, governmental intervention here. And if the system is working fairly well, you probably don't want governmental intervention. It's only, it's only when you hit a crisis moment that you probably want it to fall into place. You know, I understand, though, <laughs> you know, your points about wouldn't it be better if we were watching all this stuff all the time. So there is that reality. You got to hope that somebody is somewhere in the society uh, is, is undertaking that review. But it's not something government is terribly good at. Mm. And it typically responds to a crisis in a short-term kind of way. So we came up with these various mechanisms. None could really be called a competitiveness strategy. We came up with a bunch of pieces, right? One piece that's not on here was Semitech, which is an attempt to deal with um, Japan's effort to really capture the semiconductor sector, which was, was had, again, produced very high quality production capabilities in, in semiconductor chips, particularly DRAMs. And, um, you know, the U.S. was producing a lot of chips, but they were not as high quality, and the manufacturing process was not as efficient as Japan was. So Canada and Nikon were opposed to be able to capture a very large part of that sector. The solution the U.S. came up with, and again, this is DOD, Department of Defense, which viewed semiconductors as a pretty critical national security technology, because it was embedded in all kinds of critical defense technologies. Uh, DOD agreed to cost share with a big industry organization uh, consisting of both the semiconductor fabricators, but also the supplier system the equipment and parts supplier system for the semiconductor industry. 
that community came together, eventually settled on a series of steps to build quality into the U.S. semiconductor manufacturing process, cost shared with DARPA, and you know, really turned around a sector. Now, there are other developments going on here, too. The U.S. had taken leadership of integrated circuits and uh, microprocessors, kind of the next stage of technology. And so that certainly helped. Um, but nonetheless, the effort to drive quality into semiconductor production was a very concrete example of an industry and governmental collaboration that actually worked. So these other pieces here are a little more hands-off. CRADA, by Dole Act, the Advanced Technology Program, they're not as direct. Semitech was a fairly direct effort in the particular economic sector with national security ramifications to intervene. So in some ways, that's the most seminal model that came out of this time period. But again, the minute that the IT revolution starts to take off at the beginning of the 90s, then U.S. drops its concern with manufacturing, right? And we go on to having a great time for a decade with the IT revolution, which, as we discussed, was a remarkable period of growth in an economic well-being in the U.S. How about another one, Rashid? Uh, for Hughes? Yeah, I think the uh, we kind of center our discussion a little bit on the U.S. response uh, to what's going on in Japan. Um, but I thought it might be interesting to at least touch on uh, how the different paradigms um, in sort of the U.S. Japanese culture. So in, in Japan, um, we talked about uh, kind of like these workers had uh, treating labor as a fixed cost, and so you're sort of employed for life. These paradigms play out in Japan, and they're just kind of characteristic to their culture. Um, but I think looking at international trade, uh, is this sort of the first time that we had to deal with um, a paradigm, like a difference in paradigm affecting, you know, international trade, like, and basically just like the fundamentals of the U.S. economy in a uh, pretty large and widespread way? Because I guess globalization will bring um, new countries and new actors acting in different ways. But you have there's sort of no competition until uh, Japan sort of poses this entirely different model for how to do things. Um, but I'd like to at least touch on. How does um, kind of setting up your economy and your paradigms in this way, does that provide opportunity uh, for sort of new innovation ways? Um, in that, like, if I set up, um, you know, post-war Japan in a slightly different way, do I get a slightly different outcome? I was wondering, if this might help answer that, does Japan have the equivalent of the um, U.S. labor union? Yeah, it's, labor unions are organized very differently, however. Far less adversarial. Again, if you have a lifetime guarantee of work, what's there to fight about, right? You know, why do you want to have fights, right? Wages. Instead, they're much more collaborative institutions that tend towards moving towards great efficiency to promote their, you know, their, com their company's performance. Uh, there's much greater incentive for collaboration you know, in the system they set up. Now, again, you know, some of that is faded um, as Japan has entered a much more, you know, globalized competitive world of competition um, than it faced as, a, as, as its system was emerging. But it, the, the trade-off of, you know, getting cooperation from labor around work rules and return for lifetime employment has tended to work well for Japan. And in fact, the U.S. auto industry was actually moving in that direction, uh, you know, for a time period before, again, uh, high competition kind of caught up with. Uh, but it's just a, that labor trade-off is just a completely different arrangement. I mean, look, we can look at, I, I don't want to underestimate these big macro factors that are playing here, right? So at the end of the World War II era, the U.S. and the, and the developed world, um, you know, non-communist world, essentially came to a set of arrangements around free trade concepts and 
you know, open economies and, uh, you know, lowering tariff and trade barriers and so forth. And that was a consensus system um, of the time. When Japan organized its economy and really began to move on entry as a global economic power, it organized around a different set of concepts. It was not organized around a free trading system. It was organized around a pretty mercantilist approach. Again, as part of Japan's history, it has to trade to survive. It has to export to survive, right? So they developed a very focused export system. Um, they undervalued their currency so that their manufacturers would always have a price advantage over U.S. manufacturers, right? U.S. put up with that for essentially world national security kind of reasons uh, with an ally. And, you know, we assumed we were kings of manufacturing who could interfere with us. Um, you know, Japan had a much more interventionist attitude by its government into supporting particular and assisting particular firms. That was not like the U.S. system. Uh, it made it very hard for imports, particularly of you know complex technologies, to enter the Japanese markets. So it was playing by a different set of more mercantilist kinds of roles. And frankly, that model became a model for other Asian economies. So that was a model that worked for Taiwan and for Korea and now China. And it's not based on that open trading regime consensus policy that the US tried to build at the end of World War II. So we're up against different economic models here. Part of the story is that the US hasn't really figured out what the right strategy is. But Rashida, I think I interrupted your ability to get answers to your question, David. <laughs> Yeah, so I definitely wanted to talk about the setup of these Japanese paradigms um, kind of being a little bit more pervasive in like the way that they set up, uh, just like they alluded to in the way they set up their whole economic structure. Um, and is there an opportunity for you know different countries uh, to sort of adopt different paradigms in this way? To an extent. I think it almost goes back to that discussion we had about you know, our innovation systems would really make sense to think of it as national. And I think, we you all, know, while that paradigm worked well for Asian countries, I think there would definitely be still a lot of resistance in, in the US if you tried to have a set of a, an identical paradigm here where people have these strong beliefs about free trade and placing their government. Right, although those, those are now right at the center of a major political debate really for the first time since, well, there was a debate over these issues in the 1970s and 80s, a big debate, you know, as Japan came to the forefront in two major economic sectors in particular. Uh, and we're back to that debate now. We're having it right now. Uh, and it's, so all of this is actually pretty interesting context to be watching, I think. Um, the current news, we'll have to see what the new administration proposes, but they appear to be moving in much more of a neo-mercantilist kind of direction than prior regimes. So uh, in order to figure out whether or not, not only if like other countries can combat, uh, try to uh, convert their economies to this, but what, rather whether they should, we have to figure out uh, what was the, so one of the main uh, blocks between uh, any economy and, com and uh, Japan's economy is uh, these kinds of, uh, what was the term you had for those uh, things like, um, for like railroad monopolies and oil monopolies? Oh yeah, um, what? Industrial policy. The, uh, it's the regulations that keep it from, uh, thank you, sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah, he, we're on the same wavelength. Okay, so uh, those antitrust laws, we have to figure out uh, what is it specifically within Japan that is, uh, uh, that would conflict with those laws, and uh, well, is it really the best system for the individual worker? Uh, so, like from the impression that I've gotten, uh, Japan is so uh, the government is so closely linked with uh, the industrial sector. Uh, it would be, I feel like it would be an it would 
I'm not sure how uh, how that transition could occur. It's kind of like because they just had come out from World War II, they had the opportunity to restructure from the ground up. So uh, I'm not sure if you could take a uh, an economy that's already based, even if it's a better system, and I'm not sure you could just uh, revamp it, at least in any reasonable amount of time. I do agree with that in that there's also historical and cultural factors to consider, like a lot about how America views itself as like you're pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and like competitively like getting ahead, less so than this kind of more collaborative like industrial conglomerate that is making sure everyone's okay. So I think it could uh, encounter resistance in cultures like ours where that's not as respected. Yeah, I think also there's the issue of scalability because Japan is so much of a smaller country than the U.S. Um, their structure might not translate well on a broader scale to ours, especially with the cultural difference. Because I know, um, like, educationally, um, it's very much pretty structured. Like, if you do these things, if you go to these schools, you tend to go, like, get slotted in, so to speak, into certain industries or certain roles. And that's kind of... Um, an approach that we've tried to avoid going towards here in the U.S. Um, we kind of promote, oh, you can go into whatever field you want. You don't necessarily have to, you know, go on a certain path. So I think there's definitely differences fundamentally in ideology that prevent kind of the same model being imposed upon both countries. Regarding at least the scalability mm -hmm. thing, you could possibly counter that by saying, well, we have a lot of... Uh, we have a lot of states so you theoretically could just have like a couple of states just try the similar system it'd be easier to revamp them because it's a much smaller area it's fewer people uh so i mean of course there's just still plenty of like reasons why you can't or why you shouldn't but uh it definitely would make it a lot easier to do at least look at yeah i think <clears throat> just to add on add on to that i think bruce and one of the writers from the first class actually has a whole uh he's written a lot about like these sanctuary cities, I think that's the wrong term, but he talks about cities where they have special rules for certain uh, industries. Um, and that's also especially important because especially in the last election, there, there's only certain cities that are really doing well um, because of technology. So it's like San Francisco, New York. Um, I'm probably forgetting a couple, a lot. Um, but like, <laughs> but uh, what he's really pushing is like, okay, well, we're going to get jobs in this sector in Detroit, and we're going to get jobs in this sector in Houston and bring them back. Um, and that was kind of what he was arguing. So I'm going to cut this off so we can make progress on some of the readings, but I think this is good background for us to lead into. I mean, you all raising these cultural historical factors would be great background when we hit our discussion of Korea and also of how Japan had to try and reorganize its innovation system as it got to the frontier in Glenn Fawn's piece. So hang on to a lot of these ideas. Let me jump to the next reading here, which I'm going to go through this very briefly. You know, we're now back, it's post-1990s, right? We're now back in our time uh, with that as a backdrop. I put this reading in here by Barry Lynn um, and a book that he wrote called End of the Line. It's, it's not a book that I have a lot of agreement with, but there's, <laughs> there's some interesting... There's an interesting historical perspective here that I especially want you to, to get a handle on, particularly given the conversation we just had about history and culture. So Barry Lynn argues that there's essentially three periods of U.S. kind of manufacturing industrial history. Um, there is a period between Alexander Hamilton and, you know, we'll call it 1945, the end of World War II, right? And, I mean, Hamilton is an absolutely critical figure in U.S. economic history um, because he had a remarkably big picture of what the U.S. economy could become, a bigger picture than anybody of his time, I would argue, in the political system. Uh, so, and his fundamental understanding was that in this era of a small new power 
faced with much larger contending European nations, that the only way that the U.S. keeps its independence is by building a strong, independent commercial economy. Right? So Thomas Jefferson, at the same time, is devoted to an agricultural economy and a concept of young farmer, and that's how democracy is going to take place. Hamilton is working in a completely different direction. Let's stand up a major national banking system. Let's stand up a major commercial economy. And he himself is strongly uh, dedicated to early US manufacturing industry. So he's investing in an early manufacturing plant you know, across the river from New York City and in New Jersey. So Hamilton's concept was that we need to pursue rational national self-dependence in manufacturing. And tariffs are fine, because that will ensure the growth of US manufacturing and production capability in a US economy. And he creates a lot of the fundamental institutions that, frankly, we still rely on um, in maintaining that very strong commercial economy. Then there is the post-World War II emergence of the Cold War. And Lynn argues that the US government leaves its Hamiltonian notions of national self-dependence in manufacturing to build a larger concept, right? Confronted with an international confrontation with a different economic system, the US builds a, a works towards building a world economy that integrates the US, Europe, and Japan in particular and other nations too, but those are the principal elements, in a system of mutual dependence, right? So this is not a self-dependent manufacturing system. This starts to move us in the direction of a multi-continent production system that's going to be shared by the participants. And then Lynn argues that the third stage really occurs in the 1990s as President Clinton moves to move China into the world economic system. And that notion there is a, it's a similar notion to what occurs in Europe in the post-war period. That if they integrate their economies and they all own each other, they're never going to fight World War II again, right? A lot to be said for that concept, frankly. Uh, that an economically interdependent, uh, integrated world is going to significantly reduce national security threats over time. That's essentially, Barry Lynn argues, Clinton's driving conceptual framework that this interdependent economic system tied by joint manufacturing and a common set of economic organizations will enable world peace, right? That's the notion. So the WTO agreement and China's entry into the WTO is the critical enabling step here. Um, and the West production system is indeed, um, to a significant extent, merged into China with China's production output going worldwide. Now, there's a whole defense set of perspectives here, right? There are integrationists, which Clinton would be one, according to Lynn. Um, essentially extending a Western manufacturing production system into China will bind China to a global economic system, substantially reducing national security problems. Um, and then there's a whole different school of realists that there's profound differences in these nations and their geopolitical systems, uh, geopolitical goals and their political systems that are going to endure, and the only question is which nation gains the advantage from the economic interdependence. But the next thing that Lynn argues is that um, this globalism has created its own economic determinism, right? That a new global economic system has in fact emerged here, that nobody's really in charge of, right? That nobody, no separate country, or even groups of countries can, imagine, can manage that it's larger than the ability of these countries to manage. 
So Lynn writes this before the 2008 financial meltdown, which is truly a world phenomenon, driven by failures in this country, but pervasive worldwide. And then there is these frantic moments as countries try to figure out how to manage this global financial crisis and realize how lacking in tools they are to cope with it. So kind of a final point that Lynn makes is that we've now created a system that's larger than the countries themselves, right? It's largely, frankly, deterministic and somewhat independent of them. And the ability to intervene becomes much more problematic. Right? So I thought it was just an interesting perspective to kind of throw into the mix here as we begin to think about some of these historical questions and try to think about the kind of global economy that we've been making. So who's got that one? Thanks, so much. Uh, yeah. Thanks, so, Rajiv. Uh, yeah, we can take it from there. Um, so I thought Lynn's comment on uh, kind of the interconnectedness and globalism might be very specific to this time. I think he wrote in about 2000. Um, and so he's like probably just come from the 90s um, and seen Clinton's sort of uh, definitely push towards laissez-faire business practices on the international scale, which is something that like, yeah, as Americans were like pretty used to um, this whole idea of the government is very separate from business ideals and business practices. Um, but also the promotion that now, like it's not just the U.S. that has to operate in the system, but now we have to deal uh, with sort of other countries um, that promote this. And so I thought it was pretty important that um, we kind of date him in 2000, um, where it's, we're kind of riding the high of uh, a lot of these promotion of international um, interdependence. But we do see the trouble, uh, I guess, definitely in like 2008. Um, so is there sort of room for us, not only as we develop um, in sort of this interconnected globalized world, is there room for uh, regulation and sort of governmental, new intergovernmental business practices that have to be put in place to sort of uh, keep us in check? OK, uh, to add, add on to that, and also add a fourth perspective. Um, so Andy Grove was uh, one of the thir three founders of Intel. Uh, and they, their big focus and their main core capability as a company was manufacturing, especially very like detailed, uh, uh, complex manufacturing. And so he actually wrote a let letter in 2010, um, and then he passed away in 2016, but he wrote one about why we need more manufacturing in the U.S. Um, and how it's, why it's dangerous when we don't have it. Uh, and he goes on to say, uh, Mr. Grove contrasted the startup phase of a business when uses for new technologies are identified with the scale-up phase, when technology goes from prototype to mass production, both are important, but only scale-up is an engine for job growth. And scale-up in general no longer occurs in the United States. Without scaling, he wrote, we don't just lose jobs, we lose our hold on new technologies and ultimately damage our capacity to innovate. He then goes on to talk a little bit about laissez fair and open markets, but then he argues that even though laissez fair and those principles are good, um, there is room for improvement. He talks about uh, job-centric economies and politics, where in a job-centric system, job creation would be the nation's number one objective, with the government setting priorities and arraying the forces necessary to achieve the goal, and with business operating not only in their immediate profit interest, but also in the interest of employees, and employees yet to be hired, which is beneficial to the country. He ends with saying uh, something that we're seeing right now, which is wealth inequality, um, that if, if we do have a place where we just pretty much outsource everything, we're gonna have a country that has very high profitability, but low prosperity, which is what we're seeing right now, and especially very impactful in the last like three years. Um, especially since after like 2000, well in the 2000s, everyone started to outsource all their manufacturing because it's cheaper in China, Asia, um, but that's really hurt jobs here in the US. Okay, and a statement. Sorry, who, Thanks, Martin. who wrote that? Andy Grove. Uh, so one of, the, one of the three founders of Intel. And he's also very important because Andy he, Grove also has one of my favorite remarks, which is that only the paranoid survive. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's, read, he's read a lot of great books, but the differences and the reason I add him is because his perspective is more of the business person who's seen kind of the impact versus the three sources added were mostly like politicians. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to add. Thanks, Martin. And look, a lot of the issues you just raised are going to be prime topics in next week's class, too. So. Just hang on to a lot of that. Uh, we can discuss it here too, of course, but 
would it be acceptable and or appropriate to do a straw poll of who agreed overall with Lynn's argument versus who didn't? With Barry Lynn? Yeah. Sure. Can we straw poll? Who, who generally it, thought that no, we Which part of his argument? Yeah, which yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, gray. Oh, so I think um, the piece I was missing in your analysis, uh, Bill, about his argument on Clinton is that he didn't think that was a good idea. He didn't appreciate the integrative approach because he felt that the invisible hand that we had all presumed to exist that would effectively regulate the market and ensure that everyone was acting in every, in not only their own self-interest, but also in the self-interest of the system being sustainable uh, was dangerous because it could collapse and then it did. So overall, I agree with that component. And I guess that's what I'm curious about other people's perspectives on. Do we think that his conception of how laissez-faire is implemented is generally applicable or not? I mean, that's look, that's a good summary of the point that Lynn brings us to. So thank you for pushing on that. Agree with some caveats. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, are they voting? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, let's, I wasn't let's sure. Let's simplify the same in though. Yeah. Just yeah. keep yeah. it as a, as a true. Yeah, that was a, yeah. Yeah. Do we think, <laughs> do we think laissez faire economies are dangerous in the way that Lynn has articulated them? Yes, do we? Do we? Okay, who does not? Who does not? Who thinks laissez faire is good with caveats? Have you heard of the Great Depression? (laughs) (laughs) So I think um, my caveats were definitely like you had this opportunity in laissez faire to sort of like spread um, this idea of not only comparative advantage, uh, but you also spread, hopefully, if this works um, positively, sort of like the good things. Um, and if you hit maybe Martine's point uh, and bring in um, job creation as kind of one of the central pieces uh, to sort of keeping the social tide of sort of everybody um, rising, I think you get an opportunity to sort of like spread uh, the job creation, sort of spread all these things with laissez-faire and looking um, like Clinton did towards sort of not so much outsourcing, but sort of like looking bigger than just kind of creating jobs in the United States um, to sort of rise our wealth, but like if you look at, if you can create jobs now all over the globe and integrate them into this interconnected system, you have the opportunity to sort of uh, rise the tide globally in Los Angeles. Um, I just think the main point I got from Lynn's writing is that like single po- sing- systems with single point failures are dangerous, and I feel like that would be true on any scale, he's just talking about like now we're on such a bigger scale that it's going to affect everyone. But I think that at the national scale, that would still be dangerous. Like any system that has single point failures is a concern. But I don't necessarily agree with the fact that he thinks that can't be corrected while still having a like somewhat laissez-faire system. Like I do think it would require some regulations, but like even if it was just having a few plants that make semiconductors outside of Taiwan. Like that, I feel like that could be not a huge imposition on Lassie there and reduce this like single point failure problem. Yeah, actually when I was reading that, I was thinking, uh, would it really be safer than to have every factory making every component of the phone all in the United States? Like wouldn't that just geographically cause you to be less diverse? Yeah, yeah I think that's interesting because he, he uses language to make it seem like this is what a, a globally distributed architecture looks like. But I agree. I think if you have all of your manufacturing or something concentrated in one geographical area, it's like it's not globalization. It's not really a very complex or integrated system. It just happens to be far away from your country. It doesn't make it global. Would we well, conceive of Lynn's argument as America first, then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Lynn is, Lynn is painting, you know, a dark side here. And he's painting a portrayal of opening up this system. And then the system itself begins to take control, right? This globalized financial system itself begins to take control and minimize the ability of any of the players to impact or affect them. So it's a fundamental statement about the fragility and lack of resilience and your, you know, your single point of failure 
point is well taken, Chloe. Um, it's, it's a dark picture here, and what makes it intriguing, the only reason why I still keep it in here, is that sure enough, you know, that's exactly what we ended up with in 2008. And boy, that was so close to a really massive worldwide depression that it's painful to even contemplate. So it's a, I put it in as kind of a useful warning lesson, but also a lesson about how we've moved in the international organization of our economy from a nation center to an ally center to a truly globalized kind of orientation here. And what is the what are the implications of that? We need to keep thinking about this. Uh, going back to the uh, to that whole uh, the 2008 uh, collapse, uh, you were saying that it's that it's very difficult to regulate some sort of some sort of financial system that. Um, reaches across borders, but uh, at least with the 2008 crisis, a lot of the uh, a lot of the collapse stemmed directly from the U.S., which means that at least with the collapse of that form, uh, U.S. regulations clearly would have helped significantly and would have prevented the crisis altogether. Uh, so, my my feeling is, at least if we're going to use that as the example, then uh, it, it just isn't. I don't know. I don't know how true it is then. That uh, that we can't actually regulate this system, because if you have like all these countries that are all ignoring natural disasters, like happened in Taiwan, uh, if all these separate countries are regulating their industries properly uh, in order to make sure that no bank is quote unquote too big to fail, then uh, I don't see how the system could collapse if all the individual components are doing what they should be. So let me let me put this in a different way. Sure. Um, I think this is significant. We've been talking about innovation wave. I think this is significant argument that the explosion of the financial services sector, the incredibly rapid growth of the financial services sector uh, in, the, in the 1990s and the 2000s, that's an innovation wave. There certainly were technological innovations that were at the heart of this. The IT revolution was clearly a great organizing factor. The ability of, to bring mathematics to bear, to, to, to work on the problem of big data and initial kinds of analytics, to bring algorithms to bear on market trading. These were all significant technology advances that were enablers of creating a truly globalized system. And we moved in a relatively short period from national systems financial services and financial services organizations to much larger global systems. So when the U.S. economy went down, it hit the rest of the world economy. The U.S. financial system went down. It hit the rest of the world economy in wave after wave after wave and began to jeopardize a whole nest of other financial institutions that were caught up in this very integrated kind of system. So that's more of what I'm driving at next. Um, and, you know, look, as we've discussed in innovation ways, there's always a bubble, right? And the problem with having a bubble in your financial services sector is that it brings down everything. It's one thing to have a bubble with dot-coms. Yeah, lose some dot-coms. But, you know, if you lose the world financial system, you know, because of a technological bubble, uh, it's pretty powerful. Um, Andrew Lowe is a wonderful professor of finance here at MIT. Has a, has, a, has a remarkable chart, right? The chart is, it's the history of the value of home prices adjusted for inflation in the United States. And it's a hockey stick, okay? So it's inflation adjusted, it's flat. And the numbers start getting put together in about the 1880s. And so you go along in the 1880s, you know, there's the Great Depression, right? A couple of recessions, but it's pretty stable. Then about 1990, it just skyrockets, right? It just skyrockets. And you wonder, what were we thinking? I mean, this is clearly going to be a bubble. You know, why was it the financial services sector decided that the ultimate fundamental unit of value in the world financial order is going to be the American home mortgage? Why did we do this, right? What were we thinking? But in a way, um, that's exactly what we do. Now, Andrew goes on to make an argument. We developed all these very interesting new financial tools in the course of that innovation wave. He wouldn't necessarily call it an innovation wave, but I would. Let's figure out 
if we can settle on some better units of value, right, than the American home mortgage, right? Is there a way to drive investment, which we can now mobilize at a global scale, onto much better units of value? So the project he's been involved in has been, can we drive it on innovation-based research? Can we create agglomerations of really major capital, not just 60 billion a year in a $19 trillion economy of venture capital, but real numbers, right? And move them, move those larger numbers onto the innovation system. So he's working on health research in particular. But it's, you know, it's an interesting concept. And in, in a way, it comes out of trying to wrestle with some of the points that Barry Lynn kind of put on the table. Rashida, closing thought? Yeah, um, so I think Barry Lynn probably takes uh, maybe a different position than in the time that he was talking uh, about or two. I think if he had said this in the room, uh, Bill Clinton, we would have gotten to an interesting discussion. Um, <laughs> but I was actually just wondering uh, if we could talk about this, like a little bit more of the critical reception. Um, in you know, maybe 2005 when he publishes this. Is he like the first guy to say like, maybe Los Fair wasn't a good idea, guys? Um, and then, you know, we see the after effects afterward. But uh, critically, like, I think reading this, I was pretty kind of taken aback by a lot of the things that he's saying. Like, is this um, sort of, maybe not politically, but like socially acceptable thought um, in the US in, you know, maybe 2005? Yeah, it's a, it's a moment of dissonance in our reading list, right? It's a little contrarian. So just like Charles Schultz is contrarian last week, you know, Barry Lynn is contrarian this week. So good summary. Thank you, Rashid.